Hello everybody, in this tutorial we're going to be taking a look at how you can use Cinema 4D Spyro with Corona. We won't be teaching you how to use Spyro to create simulations, uh, because that's well covered by Maxon in tutorials and documentation. Instead, we'll be focusing this tutorial on how you can render those simulations out in Corona. Now, Cinema 4D Spyro can be used to create all kinds of different effects, uh, ranging from abstract to something a little bit more realistic, like the example you see in front of you, right? So you can create really interesting smoke simulations, really interesting fire simulations, etc., etc. And so you can use Pyro to really enhance your animations and your renders. And the really cool thing for you as a Corona user is that we really extensively support Cinema 4D's Pyro. And so in this tutorial, we're going to be taking a look at how uh, the basic workflow looks like when you're trying to, you know, render out your uh, Pyro simulations with Corona. Now, before we actually go in and we start showcasing the synergy between uh, Pyro and Corona, let's first do a bit of a quick breakdown of our scene setup, just so you can have a bit of a better idea of, of how we set things up so you have some additional context. Okay, so uh, first up, let's maybe take a look at uh, where our smoke is coming from. And to do that, so we're just going to have to zoom in quite literally into our teapot. Okay, there we go. And you see the circle right here? Well, this is where our smoke is going to get emitted from. So if we hit a play on our timeline here, well, you can see that's where the smoke is coming from. All right. But now, uh, that's not all. Um, if we expand the pyro setup null here, you're going to be able to see that we are using some blockers. So this is just, you know, additional geometry that acts as a, a collider. And we're using it partly to art direct things. So, for example, this disk on top here, right? Um, what we're using it for is so that we make sure that the smoke doesn't come through these sort of um, holes in the teapot here. Okay. It's kind of blocking the smoke from escaping there. And then also, we've recreated the actual teapot. Uh, in a more low poly version, as you can see here. And that's another uh, sort of collider here or blocker, depending on what terminology you like to use. Uh, and the idea here is that instead of, you know, the, uh, the simulation having to have to deal with this sort of complexer geometry here, this is, this is relatively um, high poly, right? So as you can see, uh, and so that's why we're using sort of the low poly blocker to kind of speed up the calculations, okay? And in a nutshell, yeah, that's pretty much the breakdown of the entire scene. Okay, so that's it for the little breakdown. And what we're going to be doing next here is we're going to start talking workflows. Okay, so we have our simulation here. Uh, we're happy with it. And the workflow up to this point, th the way that it looked like is we just relied on the viewport representation of the Pyro simulation. That uh, viewport representation is really solid. It's really good. What you see is basically what you're ultimately going to get when you render out your scene uh, using Corona, right? Um, and so at this point, we, we haven't really rendered anything. We were just sort of setting up the simulation uh, purely based on what we see in the viewport. But now we're happy with it. And now it's time to start seeing how it looks like when we render it out. Now, to set things up to be rendered out, what you ought to do first here is you ought to go into your Pyro output object. And in here, you want to cache the simulation. Now, we've already pre-cached it here. So we're just going to turn that cache on uh, just so, you know, we, we did that just so you don't have to wait for the cache to complete here. It does take a minute. Uh, but before you actually cache the simulation, one thing to note here is that under object here, the typical channels that you want to export are typically, okay, uh, what you want to have in your cache is your density, okay? Uh, you want to have your temperature if you have any temperature. In this case, we just have our smoke. So this wasn't uh, this strictly necessary to be on here. And then if you want to do motion blur and things like that, you also want to um, have a lot the velocity channel in there, okay? Now, uh, the velocity channel, uh, typically it does take a little bit more space on your hard drive. So if you don't plan on doing the motion blur or if, if you're just doing test takes, in that situation, you might consider turning it off to save some space, but, you know, uh, kind of up to you and your workflow. Anyhow, uh, once you have everything cached out, uh, what you want to do is, uh, well, you want to bring in a Corona volume grid object. All right. Uh, you want to go under object here and you want to use the eyedropper tool. So you just uh, use the eyedropper tool to link the uh, Corona volume grid to the pyro outputs. So like that. Okay. Once you've done that, what you can then do is you can start rendering the scene out. So we're going to uh, turn on the interactive uh, renderer here. We're going to give it a second for it to start 
up. And before you know it, look at that. We see our, well, our rendered smoke here. Okay, so now we know how to render Pyro with Corona. But now let's let's take a look at some of the uh, settings that you have available for when it comes to controlling how the actual simulation gets rendered out. So controlling your Pyro simulation at this point is much like controlling any sort of open VDB simulation that you've in the past loaded with the Corona volume grid. Okay, if you take a look at the object properties that we have here, you're going to be able to see that our cached export from Pyro is actually a VDB file. So we're literally de dealing with VDB files. So typically what you want to do in in these situations is you probably want to play with the absorption a little bit. Okay, so what you can do here is uh, you can actually tint it. And that's going to produce well, a pretty cool result, but you know we're just going to set that back to zero so we get that normal looking uh, smoke happening. Okay, whoopsie. And there we go. Um, and then what you can do is you can play with the scale for the absorption uh, channel, right? So you can increase the scale. Uh, that's going to make the absorption much, much more um, heavier, much more emphasized. If you decrease the scale, you're going to be able to see that our uh, smoke simulation is going to look a lot more airy, right? That's just how absorption works. And then also, if you're a bit more of an advanced user, uh, you can also enable channel color mapping here, uh, you know, and play with that as well. It's a bit more of an advanced technique, but, you know, if you know what you're doing, that's that's really powerful functionality right there. Uh, then, as with any other open VDB simulation, uh, you can play around with the scattering settings as well. You can tint the scattering effect. Um, you can play with the scale of the scattering effect. So uh, if you increase it, uh, there's going to be more scattering happening. If you decrease it, uh, scattering is kind of going to be almost eliminated. So now you can see that the uh, rays get absorbed and that's why we end up with this dark smoke. There's not a lot of scattering happening there right now. And then what you can also do is uh, you can have, well, you can uncheck the single bounce only checkbox. Uh, what this is going to do is when it's checked, basically when a ray hits the volume, it's just going to bounce once. But if you uncheck it, then that ray is going to bounce multiple times. In most situations, that will mean that you will end up with these uh, brighter looking, um, you know, simulations. Uh, in our case, as you can see, the smoke got quite a bit brighter. That's because there's more scattering happening inside here now. So at this point, uh, maybe we could actually go back into the absorption uh, sort of uh, channel here and lower the uh, scale for it, maybe. Maybe we could also lower the scattering scale a little bit, maybe. Uh, maybe that's just a little bit too much. Uh, bottom line is now you can go ahead and you can play around in here. And you can also, you know, enable the a channel color mapping for scattering if you so want to and maybe just as a bit of a note for when it comes to the actual emissions uh, you know we've exported the temperature channel here as well if if you remember when we cached the simulation but since this is only smoke here we don't have any temperature in there so there's really um <laughs> there's no uh temperature channel essentially because it's, it's just black right but if if you had temperature enabled in your pyro simulation this is where you would go ahead and control it right now if you'll remember we also talked a little bit about uh, that velocity channel that you can use for motion blur if you want to enable it well again the procedure is exactly the same as with any other uh, open vtp simulation that you're loading with the corona volume grid you just go under the rendering menu here and under the motion blur and frame interpolation sort of sub menu here you want to change the mode from simple to velocity based and that's going to use that velocity channel that you've exported OK, but now obviously you also want to have the uh, motion blur be turned on in your camera's settings. OK, so with all that explained, let's maybe take a bit of a step backward and let's talk workflows again. The only workflow that we showcase so far is the recommended workflow. So that's the workflow where you work on your pyro simulation based on what you see in your viewport. And once you're feeling confident in what you're simulating, you start caching things out and then you start rendering them out. Right. So that's the recommended workflow. But now there is another workflow that we're going to explore in the next minute or two, and that that this workflow doesn't really involve you caching out your pyro simulation. This type of a workflow does have a drawbacks. It's not the recommended workflow for a couple of different reasons. Uh, but as you'll see, if you want uh, quick previews of, uh, you know, whatever you're trying to set up uh, in terms of your pyro simulation and the viewport uh, representation is not good enough for you, well, then you can leverage this workflow. Uh, but, you know, there are some drawbacks.
So if you want to try out that workflow, well, it's real simple. You know, just don't have any cache enabled in your pyro. Uh, under object here, try and make sure that your density, temperature, and whatever else you're using is set to on if you want to see it rendered out properly. And then, you know, just bring in a Corona volume grid object. Okay, uh, link it to the pyro output. You can get this warning here uh, where it's going to say that the Corona volume grid object points to a pyro output object, which has no cache stored on disk. Right. And we talked about this. It is recommended to go with the workflow that we showcased earlier. But, you know, in this case, we can just ignore this warning. Uh, we're fine with it. So we're just going to hit dismiss here. And then we're going to start up the interactive renderer. We already have our simulation in front of us here. Right. And now we just need to wait for the interactive renderer to come back online. So let's just give it a second. And whenever you're loading up your um, simulations like this, uh, the scene parsing and uh, loading of the scene might take a little bit longer. OK, uh, but it will start any second here. And as you can see, we now see our uh, uh, simulation here. Right. And we can go um, forward. Uh, you know, uh, in steps here, as you can see, right, we're, we're essentially simulating the simulation here on a frame by frame basis. And as you can see, it does work. It looks great. It looks as expected. Although obviously, because this is not cached now, if you want to go back a step, that's going to be a problem. It's probably not going to work. If you go inside your pyro output here and you start playing with some of these settings, it might actually happen that, for example, if we change the density to on export, that you're going to have to restart the interactive render because again this is not the sort of the most recommended optimal workflow uh, but you know as you saw it still works um, although you know whenever you get your simulation uh, disappearing all you want to do is you just want to restart the uh, rendering process be it interactive rendering or final rendering all right and with that we are concluding this tutorial we hope you learned something new and hopefully you've also seen that uh, you know setting up pyro to work with corona or to render with corona is real easy all right so thank you for tuning in and uh we'll see you in the next one <laughs>